What does a disused rackets court beneath the stands of a college football stadium in downtown Chicago, USA, have in common with a set of pipes leading up a Norwegian mountainside? Or come to that, what do they both have in common with a sandy waste on the banks of the majestic Columbia River in the Pacific far northwest? Or with a workbench in a dismal, long since bombed laboratory in what is now West Berlin? or with a former ranch school set amid cottonwood trees atop an isolated plateau near the Rio Grande in New Mexico. This. That the world has never been and never will be the same since those first atomic explosions is a well-worn cliché, yet a cliché well worth repeating. For most of us, the dawn of the nuclear age was as much surprising as frightening, as much breathtaking as bewildering. New phrases like splitting atoms and going critical, new words like fallout and nuclear fission entered our everyday speech without our really knowing what they signified. We talked casually of mushroom clouds and megaton deaths, of atomic piles, of nuclear reactors. Yet behind all this upsurge of jargon, behind this new terrifying stage in man's development, lies one of the most fascinating stories of all time, the story of the making of the first atom bombs. It's a story that could begin at creation itself, but we choose to begin it in the closing days of 1938, the year of Munich, and of this. December 1938 was an unhappy month for the Jews of Germany. Hitler's Nazis were forcing them to deposit their wealth in special bank accounts that were to be used to pay off the multi-million pound fine summarily imposed on them for the alleged murder in Paris of a minor Nazi diplomat by a Jewish boy. But this was only another twist of the screw of Jewish persecution in Germany. Nazi oppression of Jews had, of course, been building up ever since Hitler had come to power in Germany in 1933. The persecution had already driven many prominent German Jews from the country philosophers, artists, writers, but particularly scientists, among them the world's best-known scientist, a Jew, Albert Einstein. Like Einstein, many of these Jewish scientists were also nuclear scientists. Indeed, they included some of the world's most expert nuclear scientists. And mercifully for mankind, they chose not to stay in Nazi Germany. Einstein went to the United States, as did many others. Some fled to Britain and to Canada and to Sweden. Thus, by December 1938, a mere nine months before World War II began, the Nazis had managed to denude Germany of many of her best nuclear scientists. And yet, it was in December 1938, in Hitler's capital of Berlin, that a certain Dr. Otto Hahn split the nucleus of the uranium atom and launched the world on the nuclear age. Within weeks, 
Hahn's experiments had been repeated in Russia, America, Poland, Denmark and Britain. But it was here in Paris at the Collège de France that a team of French nuclear scientists under Nobel Prize winner Frédéric Joliot Curie, son-in-law of Madame Curie, discoverer of radium, showed how the enormous energy released in splitting the uranium atom could be harnessed either for industrial power in peace or as a terrible explosive in war. Such was Joliot Curie's progress that by mid-1939 he'd already taken out patents, the first anywhere in the world, for the construction of a nuclear reactor and for the building of a uranium bomb. A bizarre instance of how the niceties of the private enterprise system were still being faithfully followed in that final summer before total war engulfed Europe. Until now, uranium had been merely a metal powder that occasionally burst into flames spontaneously, a scientific curiosity. But in May 1939, the British government, in the person of Sir Henry Tizard, their scientific advisor, recognising uranium's new strategic importance, tried to buy from the Belgians an option on the world's most available source in the Congo. On being turned down, Tizard warned of the dangers of the uranium falling into hostile hands. As it happened, though neither Tizard nor anyone else among the Allies knew at the time, some 600 tonnes did fall into German hands when Belgium surrendered. But this fear that by having Otto Hahn and his team in their midst, the Nazis might make an atom bomb first, was the constant spur for nuclear researchers, not just in Britain and France, but in the United States too, where a group of refugee scientists persuaded Einstein in August 1939 to write a letter to President Roosevelt pleading that America should make an atom bomb, and fast. But the move evoked little immediate response. Within the month, Europe was plunged into war. The fears of the refugee scientists were certainly justified. For just a few weeks before Hitler attacked Poland, a secret conference of Germany's remaining nuclear physicists had been held under Nazi auspices in Berlin. What is more, alone of the warring powers, Germany established a department of the army devoted exclusively to the study of the military applications of nuclear fission. Worse still, she also possessed Europe's only uranium mine in Czechoslovakia. In Britain, in the early days of the war, nuclear research had a low priority, much lower, for instance, than radar research, which was of almost obsessional interest to Britain in view of her nearness to Germany and hence vulnerability to attack from the air. As a result, most British scientists were immediately detailed for radar research, or else for work on such other problems of obvious concern to the fighting services as magnetic mines and underwater detection. Indeed, such was the critical regard of this work that non-British citizens were rigorously excluded and hence aliens, like those Jewish nuclear scientists who had recently fled from Nazi Germany, were left idle, or rather free, to unravel the secrets of atomic fission. In addition, most of Britain's top statesmen, while admitting the theoretical possibility of an atom bomb, were entirely sceptical of its practical probability, certainly within their lifetime. Churchill, for one, at this time, thought talk of atom bombs was bad for morale. Indeed, that it was a ruse of enemy propagandists to reduce the British and French people's will to resist. Many scientists, too, particularly in America, had their doubts. But suddenly, in February 1940, with the phony war at its height, the deriding Thomases were dealt a death blow. Two refugee scientists working in Britain, Rudolf Piles and Otto Frisch, calculated that if instead of uranium proper, its most fissionable isotope, so-called uranium-235, was used in the bomb, the amount needed to trigger off an explosion would not be the tens of tons hitherto thought, but merely a few pounds. Dramatically, the making of an atom bomb, and more importantly, carrying it in an airplane, was now undoubtedly feasible. Uh, the immediate feeling was, of course, shock that uh, the possibility of a practical weapon that everybody, including ourselves, had regarded as extremely remote, remote now seemed to be quite real, and uh, it was obviously quite important to do something about it. Uh, it was clearly difficult and an enormous effort, but uh, also the consequences so important that it would be worth the effort. We said at the time to ourselves, well, even if the cost of this project was as much as a battleship, uh, it would be worth having. Well, 
Oh, that turned out to be rather an underestimate. I think you could have had very many battleships for, for what, what this cost. But obtaining even a few pounds of U-235 for a bomb was a staggering task. For only seven atoms of it exist among every thousand of pure uranium. And so far, no one had even been able to refine pure uranium. Since each stage of separating it simply enriched the existing U-235 by less than 1%, several thousand stages would be needed, each a technological complex in itself, so that the plant as a whole would be bordering on the fantastic. Well, the essential difficulty is the extreme reactivity of uranium hexafluoride, which is the gas used to separate the uranium isotope. It's one of the most viciously active chemicals known. While Paris half-heartedly prepared for a German attack it never believed would come, the French nuclear team went on trying to produce atomic power. Their progress was nil, until one of them had the bright idea of using so-called heavy water in their chain reaction. At that time, in early 1940, the world's sole source of heavy water was here at Ryuken in central Norway. Tipped off that the Germans were beginning to take an interest in it, and hence could be on the same tack as himself, Frédéric Joliot-Curie persuaded the French Secret Service, in one of the most bizarre espionage episodes of the whole Second World War, to snatch the world's total stock of heavy water from under German noses only weeks before they overran Norway. But no sooner had the French scientists begun using the heavy water than France itself was threatened by Hitler's sudden advance into the Low Countries in May 1940. As the panzers approached Paris, the vital heavy water was taken south first to Clermont-Ferrand, where it was hidden in a women's prison. And then, when France's collapse was certain, the British persuaded the French to ship it to Britain. Arriving at Bordeaux just the day before Marshal Pétain took over France, the heavy water made its way to safety on a battered British cola, which barely missed being mined in the Bay of Biscay. While the air battle for Britain raged fiercely, teams of scientists got down to the hard theoretical slog of perfecting the bomb, though at times their working conditions bordered on the ludicrous. By the middle of 1940, I think we were really all out for it, working almost day and night. But by that time, some other mm, difficulties arose. You see, this at a time when Britain became very conscious of the war. This is after Dunkirk. And although I've been working on the, perhaps the most secret project in the war, I was still an alien, and there were certain rules applying to me. For example, the curfew, I was not allowed out uh, outdoors in the after dusk. And so often when I worked late in the lab, I had to smuggle my way through home uh, in the fear of being arrested on, on the way. Of course, not allowed to have a bicycle or, or a car, not allowed to, uh, say, on, have any maps, or had to have a special permit each time I uh, wanted to leave Liverpool. Thanks to these refugee scientists working in beleaguered Britain, by mid-1941, the basic theoretical work on a uranium bomb had been virtually completed, such that when the so-called Maud Committee, set up to supervise the research, reported to Churchill, he gave them the go-ahead to build a pilot plant in North Wales for producing U-235. Said Churchill at the time, although personally I'm quite content with the existing explosives, I feel we must not stand in the path of improvement. News had reached him that the Germans had begun assembling their first atomic pile as early as December 1940, though he did not know it had failed miserably. To Churchill in that summer of 1941, with the Russians apparently wilting before the German onslaught and the British Commonwealth being pushed back in the Middle East, anything was worth a gamble. But of course, the United States had not yet come into the war. As a result, American nuclear scientists were not experiencing the same urgency as their British and French confrères. But Pearl Harbor changed all that. Though in point of fact, the official United States decision to expand nuclear research based on the optimism of the British, preceded the surprise Japanese attack by a few hours. Even so, until Roosevelt and Churchill met in June 1942, the US and Britain continued to pursue separate research paths on the bomb. And the decision then to pool resources still didn't stop the squabbles between the two countries, particularly as to whether the results of the research were to be shared equally after the war.